All right, so welcome to Eat, Move, Think, the show about optimal wellness brought to you by MyCan. Wow. Oh, I was practicing. <laughs> okay, ready? <coughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome to Eat, Move, Think, Think, the show about optimal, optimal, optimal wellness. Brought, brought to you, you by Megan. Yeah, that, this is extremely good. Thank you. There are a couple of myths, I think, in nutrition that probably we should start with here. So one of them is that there is guidance on what is the best diet for everybody. Right. Yeah. Okay. So hold that thought in your mind. Got the it. other thing is that is a calorie is a calorie. Yes. Let's say you're burning on a daily basis 2160 calories. Okay. Yeah. A calorie is a calorie says it doesn't really matter if you're eating chocolate or just vegetables. Yeah. The number of calories is the ultimate arbiter of how much weight you are carrying around. Yeah. Both of those turn out to be wrong. Uh-huh. And that's kind of what personalized nutrition is all about. I'm particularly interested in personalized nutrition as someone who's always been the first one to be full, regardless of my size compared to other people. Like I just don't eat as much as other people. I get full faster and it doesn't necessarily mean I'm less or more healthy. So this is interesting to, yeah, to people like me. That's interesting. I mean, some people will lose weight better on a low fat diet and some people will lose weight better on a low carb diet. Ooh, okay. And there are things that you can do to tell whether you're the person who's going to lose weight on a low carb diet oh. versus a, a low fat diet. That answers a lot of questions for people, I think. And that's just the start. So personalized nutrition is this thing where eventually you'll be able to test somebody's microbiome mm -hmm. and test their genes and test numerous different things. Then based on that and your overall objective, an expert one of these days, We'll be able to tell you. Here is exactly your perfect personalized diet for your body and your body only. Yes. That's exciting. So who's the expert here? It's Christopher Gardner. So he's the director of nutrition studies at the Stanford Prevention Research Center. Yes. Here he's talking about the future of personalized nutrition and a study that he just came out with that's all about personalized nutrition. And he's being interviewed by Leslie Beck, MedCan's director of food and nutrition. I'm Jazz. I'm Chris. We're the producers of Eat, Move, Think. Our guest today is Christopher Gardner. He's actually been on the show before. Mm -hmm. He was on episode 87. All about fermented foods, right? And how they affect the gut microbiome. How Kimchi. Really, really good for you. I hope you guys are eating for your fermented foods. Okay, without further ado, here is Leslie Beck, MedCan's Director of Food and Nutrition. And she's speaking with Christopher Gardner, the Director of Nutrition Studies at Stanford University's Prevention Research Center. Okay, I'm going to grab a healthy personalized snack and uh, let's do it. Hi, I'm Leslie Beck, Clinical Director of Food and Nutrition at MedCan, and I'm here with Christopher Gardner. Thank you so much for joining us today, Christopher. Yeah, glad to be here again. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about a recent study you conducted that was published in Cell Reports Medicine. You were the co-senior author on it. And the findings of your research revealed a number of unique factors that could predict weight loss success, both over the short term and long term. And really, I think your findings set the stage for a personalized nutrition. But before we dive into the study findings, can you define for us what exactly is meant by personalized nutrition or precision nutrition, as it's often called? Sure. And let's actually think where it arises from. So let's see, I've been doing studies for decades. And whenever I report all my results in a medical journal, here's the average, et cetera. But I've been having a lot of fun lately publishing results as what I call a waterfall plot, where you put every single person on there. And instead of showing an average and a, some sign of variability, like a standard deviation or a standard error, everybody's on there. And you can see that despite the average, somebody was well above average and someone was well below average. What is that? How come everybody doesn't respond the same way? And we always find what we might call hyper responders and hypo responders. Uh -huh. So personalized nutrition would just be saying, okay, I got a lot of people who lost weight on low carb. I got a lot of people who lost weight on low fat. Is it possible that some people should be on one and some should be on the other? because of either a genetic predisposition, a metabolic predisposition, a cultural predisposition. So some way of tailoring what advice we're giving so someone has a greater chance of success. By looking at their 
own unique factors. Yes. Right. Okay. So you mentioned this in the study as well, but for years we've thought that a calorie was a calorie when it comes to losing weight. You know, it doesn't matter where your calories come from. As long as you eat less of them, you'll lose weight. But recent research suggests that it's more complicated than that. Can you speak to this? Yeah, sure. One of the easiest ways I'll speak to it is just satiety. So yes, if you had X number of grams of sugar, X number of grams of broccoli, X number of grams of soda pop, X number of grams of coffee. I mean, technically they all can, if you measured it in some kind of chemical analysis system, it would tell you how many calories are. I don't know if your audience knows what the definition of a calorie is. It's actually the amount of energy that's required to raise a liter of water by one degree Celsius. It's some very technical term like that. It all has to do with heat generated from breaking apart the bonds that were in that molecule. But for us, it's, oh, I need 2000 calories. Oh, you need 1400 calories. Oh, you need 2500 calories. You can have two people eat exactly the same thing and have a slightly different response. So part of that could be metabolic. Part of it could be that as they digested it, one person was simply more efficient than the other one. And in that case, low efficiency would be good. Like you'd be burning extra energy from eating the same amount of food. Oh, lucky you. Right, you right. actually got to eat more and you'd be giving off more heat than the other person because you burned more bonds in this food. So that'd be one way to be personalized. Another way for me would be sort of cultural or societal or from a satiety point of view, I ate this and you know, the person next to me eating the same thing. And I stopped like five minutes before they did. I was full. They weren't full. They were eating the same food I was, but they were less satiated than I was. And I'm more satiated than, oh, and this might affect what I eat two hours from now. And oh, this might affect what I eat tomorrow morning, the next day. And so, yes, the calorie is a calorie if you burn it in what's called a bomb calorimeter. Mm -hmm, right. As two people eat the same food, they stop at different times. They metabolize them differently. It affects what they do later in the day. Maybe it gives them more energy and they go for a run or gives them less energy and they don't go for a run. And two people can eat the same thing and have a different result. I see. Yeah. So people are unique in how they respond to calories. Yes. You identify two main factors that can influence a person's ability to respond to a weight loss diet. One of them was inflammation and the other one was our gut microbes or our gut microbiome. I want to talk briefly about each one. So first of all, how might inflammation affect weight loss? Yeah. Well, inflammation has a lot to do with our metabolism and it's also really related to the microbiome in general. I also need to add how challenging it is to measure inflammation, Leslie, for your listeners, right? And so if you don't mind my taking one step back. So for many, many years, we've established cut points of healthy and unhealthy levels of blood cholesterol, glucose, blood pressure, weight. And we have some standard numbers for those. When you plug all those in and you try to predict someone's risk for, let's say, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, it, it really helps explain who does and who doesn't get sick. But there's a level it doesn't explain. And over the last 10 or 20 years, this idea of inflammation has been huge. It I'm going to guess that every one of your listeners has heard of inflammation, and yet not a single one of your, well, maybe one or two, let's see how this might play out. Nobody goes to their doctor to learn their inflammatory status. Unless you have severe inflammation like rheumatoid arthritis or something like that. But as a, as a standard clinical measure, you can't go in and say, oh, Leslie, you rock. You have an inflammation number of 25. Christopher, yours is 40. God, I wish you could get it down to Leslie's. If you would just do these things, you could get your 40 to a 25. And if you can't, I have a drug for you and that'll do it. No. We can't do that. You can't actually do that. I'm really... Very fortunate that on the Stanford campus working with Dr. Mike Snyder, who is my co-senior investigator on this, we have access to the Stanford Human Immune Monitoring Center, and their lives focus on inflammation and immune function. And they have the capacity, boy, if I had the money, I can spend a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, 10,000 bucks looking at all the specific metrics they have of inflammation. And on the one hand, that is fabulous. We feel like we're at the cutting edge of understanding inflammation, but where we are not in the area of personalized or precision nutrition is telling you what your inflammatory number is 
and telling you exactly how to fix that. So I really think that paper that we published is fantastic. It moves the field forward, but I, I need to throw some caution in here. It doesn't actually give you a specific path or a specific thing to follow up on yet. We've been trying to get there. And the, the whole inflammatory pathway and immune function is so complicated. We don't yet have a simple practical thing for your listeners, but the idea still holds. Inflammation explains a bunch of the difference that calories, weight, blood pressure, cholesterol, glucose don't. I see. Okay. Well, let's dig into your research right now. So first, can you tell our listeners what motivated you to do this particular study? What were you hoping to learn? <laughs> so I have to be honest here. This part of the study is a fishing expedition because this all came from a main trial that we published in 2018. And it was called Diet Fits. That was the acronym, the Dietary Intervention, Examining the Factors, Interacting with Treatment Success. And what we really had hoped to see was we actually thought insulin resistance would be a predictor of differential success on low carbon, low fat diets. We also thought we had a genotype pattern. So we thought there was a low carb genotype pattern and a low fat genotype pattern. And what do you mean by that? There are genes in your body. I guess we should take even one step back further for your, your listeners. What does your DNA do? It's a code for making all kinds of things, including enzymes, hormones, fingernails, hair, et cetera. And some of the things that it codes for are the enzymes that break down and put together your fats and carbs. Okay. And so if you had some slight variations, they're called, sorry for the technicality, they're called SNPs, right. single nucleotide polymorphisms. If you have a certain set of SNPs, you might accelerate the production of those enzymes or depress them. That might increase your capacity to metabolize carbs or fats or decrease your capacity. And so based on a bunch of preliminary research, we thought we had found one of the keys that would be precision nutrition, but let's not go too far down this rabbit hole because neither of them worked. This was an $8 million study with 600 people. It took four years of my life and neither the genotype pattern nor the insulin resistance ended up being helpful in terms of, oh, we know what this is at baseline. Maybe we can predict who will do better in the long run. It didn't work. So in steps Dr. Michael Snyder. He is the chair of our genetics department at Stanford. He is the master of wearables. If you've never heard his name before, you could Google him or look him up. This guy is brilliant, well-funded, and he's always wearing a Fitbit and a heart monitor and another monitor and checking his microbiome and checking his glucose with a continuous glucose monitor. So Basically, he and some of his postdocs said, well, you didn't explain the variability in your study with those two factors you looked at. But if you did look at our data, remember I started our talk here with this idea of the waterfall plot, who does best and who does worst. And this um, one year weight loss study with low carb or low fat on both diets, somebody lost 50 pounds somebody gained 20 pounds. And there was a wide range, right? It was an absolute continuum from one end to the other. So it's not that we failed to find the predictors because there wasn't any variability. There was a lot of variability. And we failed with our initial hypothesis to prove that we were right. Those two things would be the predictors. It's We're almost obligated to dig deeper into the data to see what we could come up with in terms of was there, were there other factors? And the caution here is that we looked at a lot of things that didn't work. And so it's a little unfair to focus on the things that did look interesting, but this actually sets us up for the next study. Oh, took this fantastic database. Let's see if we can go further with this hypothesis, this new hypothesis. And you're, again, you're trying to find unique factors that can explain different in success rates for weight loss for people in the study who were you know, eating, why is somebody eating the, the exact same healthy, low carbohydrate diet? Why do some people do much better than others? Um, that's what, so that's what you're trying to find out. Cause it's not fair. I mean, as we sat, Leslie, as we sat with these people, we actually warned them ahead of time. We said, we're going to have you come in for group sessions. We can almost guarantee that some of you are going to be coming into these group sessions, looking across the table at someone who got exactly the same advice and they lost more weight than you, or you lost more weight than them. And this shouldn't be a shaming thing. 
this shouldn't be any kind of, well, it is a puzzle, but you shouldn't look and say, God, you know, life is unfair. How come? Well, it's not, not just that it's unfair. We should, our job as scientists is to try to figure out what might explain some of those individual personalized differences. Yeah, why some people do well and others on the same exact same diet, eating the exact same number of calories, for example. I bet you many of your listeners have that same experience like, oh, my friend did this and it worked and they, they sold me on it and I tried and it didn't work for me. Right. I feel like our society says, oh my gosh, you don't have the willpower. Oh, this thing's wrong with you. No, actually, you probably did it well. You probably did your best. And there were probably some personalized differences that we owe it to you to try to figure out what those are to help you. So this particular study, you you looked at data from the, the Diet Fits randomized control trial that was published in 2018, it was a one-year weight loss intervention. So now you're looking at looking for things that could explain differences in, in success. So tell me what sort of things did you measure? What did you look at? Well, another really hot topic here is the microbiome. Again, this, this is just as complicated as inflammation. So I think I'll bet you most of your listeners also know that there are potentially trillions of microbes on us and in us. I have heard the term used three or four kilos or maybe you know six or seven pounds of us. If you got rid of all of us, there'd be all these microbes. The most concentrated source where they are is in the gut. And the reason this is fabulous for me as a nutrition scientist is so much of what we eat, if we don't absorb it in our upper small intestine and get our vitamins and minerals, proteins, carbs, and fats, the rest of it goes on to the colon. And that's the place where we make our stool and have bowel movements and go to the bathroom. And that all sounds pretty icky. And it is. <laughs> Fortunately, I have been able to pair with Justin and Erica Sonnenberg, who specialize in this. And... You could do this at home. There are some companies that will measure your poop for you, um, but you send it in and you say, let's see if we can quantify and qualify what bugs are in you. Bifidobacterium is, is just one simple example of a microbe that seems to be beneficial. And when people are healthier, it goes up. And when they're less healthy, it goes down. But some of this interest goes back to our really disgusting finding that bewildered all of us. And it had to do with a condition called C. difficile. And C. difficile is a horrific sort of raging diarrhea, horrible GI distress type of situation. And there really wasn't any kind of treatment for it at all. And I honestly don't know the history for this. We can now cure that eight out of nine times with a fecal transplant. Right. I knew you saw this coming. I could see it in your face. <laughs> really a fecal transplant? And so part of that is introducing a different set of microbes into yours that colonize your colon. Uh, this is somewhat backed up in a different situation with some obese mice and lean mice, and they put the poop of one in the other and switched them both, and the lean mouse got obese. The obese mouse got lean, eating the same amount of food, in theory. And so there, there's just really some fascinating things that the microbes are chewing up some of the things that end up in your colon, generating energy, but as they're eating those foods that they see in the colon and fueling themselves, they make metabolites that they secrete into our blood and we can absorb them in the colon. The general impression here is if you have a healthy microbiome, those metabolites, those little particles, those little molecules they generate while fueling themselves, lower inflammation and improve immune function which is also getting back to my original hypothesis related to insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance. So this is a wildly popular topic right now. I'm going to throw more caution in here. So we found some really interesting microbes in the gut, but this needs to be replicated by many people. Really fascinating. All right, let's talk about the findings of your study. You measured their microbiomes of these participants. I think you did blood samples. You looked at blood proteins as well. You also measured their respiratory quotient. So can you help us understand that? You know, you measured this at the beginning, at the outset of the study and throughout. So what does this mean and, and what does it indicate with respect to perhaps weight loss? Yeah, and this actually is something that you can measure. It's certainly not a standard clinical measure. So you'd have to go back another 100 years, maybe not that far back, 
if you were a chemist, if you were a biochemist, you could actually look at the structure of sugars and you could see that they differ slightly in terms of how much carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen they have. Respiration involves breathing in oxygen and breathing out CO2. We have mechanisms where you can put a face mask over your face and you can quantify how much oxygen came in and how much carbon dioxide left. Okay. And so to oversimplify this, if all you were burning for energy at the moment was glucose or sugars, it would be a one-to-one -one ratio, oxygen in, CO2 out. If you were only burning fat, it would be a ratio of 0.7 molecules of oxygen in for every one molecule of carbon dioxide leaving. And that is the respiratory quotient. Uh, it has a couple other names, but it really is just the oxygen CO2 exchange ratio. Okay. And so on a typical day, you and I burn both carbohydrate and fat uh -huh. all day long. Most of us think it's much more efficient to burn them both. And so a very typical respiratory quotient might be 0.82 or 0.83, something like this. But not everyone is the same. Somebody's 0.82 somebody's 0.86, and there's some very small variations in there. And so what we found was if you looked at people who were a little high or a little low, that's where some of the difference was found. If you were better, it sort of suggests you might prefer burning carbs or prefer burning fats just slightly over the next person. So that might make it easier for you to go low carb or easier to go low fat. So if this quotient shows or this ratio shows that your body prefers to burn carbohydrates, then you might do less well eating a high fat, low carb diet. Is that what it means? Yes. Okay. Uh huh. And if your body prefers burning fat, you're not going to do as well on a high carbohydrate, low fat diet. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about your findings a little bit more. Um, you divided this up into there was short-term weight loss defined as over the first six months, I believe, and then you define long-term weight loss. Let's talk about the findings of your study. When you looked at the short-term findings over the first six months, what factors did you see predict weight loss success? It seemed to be this respiratory quotient idea that we've been discussing, as well as the quality of the diet. So an important thing for me is if you just tell me low carb or low fat, I can create a low quality and a high quality diet for both of those. I can pick the least nutritious things that are low carb or the most nutritious things, same for low fat. And so to me, that makes a lot of sense. And this is a 12 month study. And if you wanna look at weight loss success, it usually mostly happens in three months, kind of plateaus at six. People don't want to just lose weight short term. They want to lose weight permanently. Yeah. yeah. And so to be honest, a lot of the field has sort of moved on to say, you know, you can, you can pretty much lose weight on many different diets. The big challenge that most people face is weight loss maintenance. And so that's why Mike Snyder's team was fantastic here coming in because they have the capacity to look at all these proteins from proteomics. Can you define what proteomics is? Omics is just the study of anything. And so proteomics is the study of proteins. We have lots of proteins circulating in our blood. Some of the proteins are enzymes. Some of the proteins are hormones. Some of them are metabolites or, or simply molecules that people have been identifying. Sometimes we don't actually know the purpose of what they do. And we've identified them as being high or low. You might have heard of something like trimethylamine oxide uh -huh. is a really hot topic in cardiovascular disease right now. And we think we know what it does, but we know it's circulating and we know it's higher in people with heart disease. But mechanistically, that's one of those hard things to actually pin down directly. So we're doing these proteomic studies where, and you get hundreds, if not thousands of molecules, Leslie, when you do uh -huh. this. So it's a little unfair. In fact, in this field, there's something called false discovery rate. And there's a one type of statistics where you see if A is better than B. If you have a thousand things that you're looking at, you have to adjust your normal statistical cutoff for what you would assume would just be a false discovery rate because you looked at so many things, something would be significant. So the Snyder Lab is really good at looking at thousands of things at once. Uh -huh. If something rises to the top, and so that's what they found. They found, you know, whichever were the highest things that came out of that, 
which means they merit further study. They don't actually prove that that's the thing that caused the weight loss maintenance, but it's a hint. Right. Here we've got some insight into what the next idea should be for precision or personalized nutrition. Hey, we have these hints from the study. Here's the ones who had the most versus the least weight loss maintenance success. Okay. We design a new study to look at those microbes and those proteins in the blood. So short term for the first six months, weight loss success was predicted by the quality of your diet following a higher quality, low carb or low fat diet, of course, being adherent as well. And then long term, what you're saying is that when you studied proteins in the blood, when you studied the gut microbiome, there were certain things about certain bacteria or certain types of proteins in the body that influence weight loss success or maintenance over the longer term. And that's where we owe it to the public to pursue some of those. So this doesn't answer that, but it gives us a potential key to follow up and say, ah, now if we intentionally manipulate those, would that be the thing that helps someone? And can we do that with diet? Or is that something that somebody would do with a drug they would uh, create the opportunity for that to be overexpressed or underexpressed. Is there something we could eat? Should we be eating broccoli because broccoli has a fiber that feeds this particular microbe in the gut, which makes this metabolite? So it's all very fascinating and all still, unfortunately, preliminary. The other thing that came out for the short term that is that, and this goes back to diet quality, I suppose, was that on the healthy low carb diet, a higher intake of vitamins K, vitamin C, vitamin E was associated with more weight loss, which means that they're probably eating more vegetables and nuts and avocados and olives and olive oil. Whereas people on the healthy low fat diet, a higher intake of whole grains and fiber was associated with more weight loss success. Um, and a higher intake of added sugars and sodium was associated with less success. And that's perfect. And that's intuitive, right? So this is supporting all the things that we find when we try to make dietary recommendations. But this is proof of concept looking at this study and saying, yes, all those nutrients, which we know come from all those foods, are consistent with this idea of healthy weight loss and hopefully healthy loss, uh, weight loss maintenance in the long run. So these findings are preliminary, as you say, but they will help I would think, to advance the field of precision nutrition, which you've been working on, as you say, for some time. As a registered dietitian, I would love to hear how you envision what precision nutrition will look like in dietetic practice. How will my practice be different? You know, one of the opportunities and challenges of food is there are so many options out there. And sometimes we're sort of paralyzed by how many options there are. And as a registered dietitian, as any kind of health professional, you would want to steer somebody towards healthier foods. But what if one was oatmeal and the other one was eggs? What if one was uh, cashews? Okay, this is never going to happen, but cashews versus pecans. I mean, what if you had two foods that you consider to be equally healthy and your patient really didn't care which one? They liked the taste of both of them. They were accessible. They were affordable. They really had a different impact on somebody. So maybe somebody, you know, really should be avoiding these nightshades that don't come up for me very often, but that's what um, potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, bell peppers, somebody's really in tune to cruciferous vegetables. So they got those isothiocyanates and those cancer fighters in them. So there are whole groups of vegetables and produce and, and other kinds of things that have characteristic molecules that if we, if we find some of these answers, we could say, yeah, you don't have to avoid cashews, but you should have more of this other thing. You don't have to avoid tomatoes, but you should have more broccoli. So our goal for you as a dietitian would be able to say, yes, you should try to lean more this way and not put you in the position of dichotomizing. You have to avoid this. That's always backfired, uh -huh. right? Right. So in the future... I will be able to have results from a microbiome test, look at genetics, look at blood work and proteins and that, and be able to tell, get a feel for how a patient would respond to a particular diet, whether it's a diet to lose weight, whether it's a diet to help them lower their cholesterol or their blood sugar, and give them that very tailored advice that relates to their unique factors. That is the dream. We did the test. You're missing this microbe. I know what I could feed you to eat this. 
try eating this. Oh, you didn't like it that way. Let's try preparing it a different way. Oh, now you like it. Good. Let's see. Oh, now that microbe is there and it's present. Oh, now let's look at your blood work. Yes. That thing that was high is lower now. Right. Ah, thanks for working with me. We identified something that's very personal for you. So what's your best guess on when precision nutrition will be ready for prime time? I mean, I've read the National Institutes of Health predicts that personalized diet assessments and diet advice will become mainstay in medical care by 2030. What do you think? Well, it's not going to be an all or nothing thing. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to find, yes, ah, I can move that microbe with this and it lowers this thing here. And that works for some people. But yeah, it's going to be an ongoing process and it's going to be decades before this expands to be relevant to all people. But yes, I see by 2030, there being some early signs of yes. I mean, so this is a silly example, but that fecal transplant for C. difficile, uh -huh. I mean, that was just sort of a game changer and, and it works. It doesn't work for anything else though. So now we're trying to look what else we can do with the microbiome. And with all the studies being done, what you referred to was a five-year effort from the NIH. It's 170 million dollars going to five different centers, six actually technically, and they're feeding people different foods and they're getting blood and they're getting stool. They're getting 10,000. And then they're going to take 2,500 of those and they're actually going to feed them entire meals for four weeks or so at a time. And then they're going to take 500 of those and incarcerate them. <laughs> they're going to lock them up so that they have ever increasingly more rigorous uh, assessments of what they're eating. And in each of these different groups, they're going to do blood work and stool work and other things. I actually get to consult with a group called Zoe that is also recruiting 10,000 people so that they can do that. And so the interesting thing here is 10,000 from the NIH, 10,000 from Zoe, more from other people doing this. So at that point, we've got machine learning and artificial intelligence looking at huge numbers of things and parsing out what the most exciting things are. And that is in process. That is happening. We will have those data in five years for thousands and thousands of people. Amazing. So in the meantime, then, what's your diet advice for people who want to lose weight and keep it off? What can set them up for long-term success? What's something that everyone could do well by? So for both a low carb and the low fat diet, the central themes were eating more vegetables, being really focused on fiber. If you wanted to pick a food group, vegetables and beans. If you wanted to pick a nutrient, pick fiber. If you wanted to flip the coin and say absence of refined grain and absence of sugar, those work in exactly the opposite way. They're pro-inflammatory, not anti-inflammatory. They're ubiquitous in all the foods that we've been eating lately. You know, this massive amount, one particular journal article says 40% of our calories come from added sugars and refined grains. So we have to flip that to vegetables, beans, fiber. And from the previous study that you got to talk to me about with my colleagues, Justin and Erica Sonnenberg, that fermented food. Exactly. Really an interesting idea, the idea of actually consuming live bacteria. So one is called prebiotics and one is probiotics. So the fiber feeds the bacteria but getting some new bacteria introduced there, fermented food is also taking off right now, at least in my area, I don't know about yours. And so I can't say we know everything about fermented food. Should you have yogurt? Should you have kimchi, sauerkraut, kombucha? Yeah, I can't direct you to one over the other. Gut shots, we have a lot of gut shots here, but I've been seeing people eat a lot more fermented food around me and a lot more products are being offered. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen the same thing. People are really interested in fermented foods now and, and consuming them, at least the clients I see. So that's great. Christopher, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. It's been fantastic talking to you. I've learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners have. And I'm really excited about the future of personalized nutrition. So thanks again. Thank you, Leslie. That was MedCan's Director of Food and Nutrition and our EAT host, Leslie Beck, in conversation with Dr. Christopher Gardner, the Director of Nutrition Studies at the Stanford Prevention Research Center. If you want to talk to somebody about incorporating personalized nutrition techniques into your diet, book a consultation with a MedCan dietitian by emailing clientservice 
at medcan.com. You can follow Medcan on Twitter and Instagram at MedcanLiveWell. Definitely follow Leslie Beck on Twitter as well. That's Leslie Beck RD. And you can follow Dr. Christopher Gardner on Twitter at Gardner PhD. Yeah, and his Twitter feed's great. Yeah. We'll post time coded insights as well as episode links, including to the latest Christopher Gardner study yeah. at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. And we want you to say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion. So email us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. We really want to hear from you. Yeah. Do you have like a wellness story? Do you have an idea for an episode to explore? Or do you just want to comment on a recent episode? Eat Move Think is produced by Ghost Bureau. I'm Jasmine Ratch, managing producer. I'm Christopher Shulgin, executive producer. And then also helping out is Andrew Imax, Emily Bozik, and Chantal Gertan. Yes. And we will be back soon with a new episode examining the latest in health and wellness. This podcast episode is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation for endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with any specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.